This is All India Radio, Calicut. You now listen to a talk titled, A Teacher's Calling. The speaker is Professor C. A. Shepard. On the face of it, teaching seems to be no longer a vocation, but a profession, or worse still, a trade, and a promiscuous one at that. On the one hand, there is the invasion of experts and specialists with their theories and techniques. They certainly have much to contribute, the learning process being very complex, but they do more harm than good if they dominate or domineer instead of being satisfied with the subordinate status of helpers. For teaching, especially at school, is much more than the learning process. On the other hand, many enter the ranks on the rebound because they have not landed full volley in the profession of their choice. This is nothing to be ashamed of, in spite of Bernard Shaw's scathing epigram, he who can, does, he who cannot, teaches. After all, it is not everyone who can be a Shaw, and what is more, many great writers have spent a period of their lives schoolmastering. A good teacher is made as well as born, and one can make oneself that if one adopts the ideals of the teacher's calling and lives up to them. In teaching, as well as the priesthood, social service, or scientific research, vocations are not inborn, but can be made with goodwill and effort. By a complete identification of oneself with a cause, one converts a profession or a trade into a calling. In Galsworthy's short story, Quality, the Gessler brothers make boots their calling, for in spite of competition from the factories with their cheap shoddy footwear, these men never sacrificed their high standards or principles. They were martyrs to perfection. Teachers, however, should not be expected to undergo martyrdom by being content when they are underpaid. They cannot live on love and fresh air, as the saying goes, and even if they can, they have no right to make martyrs of their families. But the genuine teacher is not mercenary either, and ready to desert his post for a higher salary. This, however, is an intricate moral question, which in today's fashionable jargon has to be faced existentially by each individual. In older times, the prestige of the teacher stood high, not because it was accorded to him, but because he earned it. Status, in fact, in any profession depends on the individual, not on his designation. A sort of conventional deference is, of course, paid to persons in high office, but it is respect for the office rather than the man. Dr. Busby was the headmaster of Westminster School in the days when Charles II was on the English throne. The doctor, wearing his gown and mortar board, was teaching a class when the king paid a surprise visit. He put a few questions to the boys and was satisfied with their knowledge. But when Busby had conducted him out of the room, he said, Dr. Busby, I'm all admiration for you as a teacher. But why didn't you doff your cap when I entered? Surely the boys would learn greater respect for your king from your example. Sire, said Busby, my boys have first to learn that when I am in the classroom there is no one greater than I am, not even the king. I shouldn't like to speculate on the fate of a modern Busby standing up for the teacher's status even before the inspector of schools, let alone the Munster for an educational expert. The teacher's calling, indeed, has fallen on evil days, but teachers have themselves to thank for the state of affairs, and only they can restore their pristine dignity. No artificial measures, such as government or social policy, can be of much help unless teachers help themselves. In ancient India, the teacher was not only above the king, but above God. Obedience to the teacher came before even obedience to one's parents, Less than fifty years ago, at any rate in my childhood, the teacher was all in all to his pupils. He stood not only in loco parentis, but was looked up to with fear and trembling because he had earned that place. The teacher's calling merits a certain kind and degree of respect, but no bless so bleach, as the saying goes. Privilege entails responsibility. The teacher is called upon today not merely to impart information, but to be a parent substitute. 
it will be good if he becomes one. Parents with their ploys and play have little time with their children, perhaps little time for them. The child is a natural hero worshipper and comes to regard the teacher as his fountain of inspiration as well as wisdom. How many teachers are there who can rise to the occasion? If we cannot know, how soon and how well can we? Teaching at all levels, from the primary school to the research department, is not so much instruction as an emanation of the teacher's personality. I can best illustrate this point from personal experience. In the lower forms, I hated mathematics, because the teacher insisted that every margin should be exactly perpendicular, and every circle should be circular. A couple of years later, I was under a teacher who did not care whether your circle was like an egg, or your margin was only halfway down to hell, or whether it was there at all. Many students have taken a lifelong aversion to a subject because the teacher failed to communicate a zest for it, and many, on the other hand, have reached the heights in their chosen field of study because a certain school teacher blazed a trail. A corollary of this fact is that the teacher is a potential force for good or evil. Educational psychology, technical expertise and the rest are far less important than that. Four hundred years ago, at a time when Latin had pride of place in European education, there was an English headmaster who insisted that his pupils should be well grounded in their mother tongue. His name was Mulcaster, and the famous English poet Edmund Spencer was one of his pupils in the Merchant Taylor School. He is mentioned here because of his view of education, which is valid today and for all time, namely, that in education what we have to deal with is not a mind, but a man. All that has been said so far about school applies mutatis mutandis to the university. This is, in a way, a more crucial stage in education, because one has to deal with adolescents adjusting themselves to adulthood. Their problems call for particular sympathy. They do not readily confide in their parents. Neither are parents generally capable of understanding them. Growing up is a time of inner conflicts and tensions, and young people feel lost, isolated, and thrown on their own resources when they do not possess them. It is vitally important that they should have someone to turn to and the teacher, through his personal encounters and familiarity with students, can do much. He must be open and accessible to them at all times. A teacher no longer belongs to himself, or even to his family, as much as people do in other walks of life. In other words, he is a dedicated spirit singled out for special worship, as Wordsworth felt in his mission as a high priest of nature. Dedication makes all the difference between a calling and a profession or trade. It describes an attitude we adopt towards the work we do. Teaching demands dedication more than any other kind of employment. Radio and TV are very useful aids to education, but they can never replace the teacher in the classroom. The best instructors may be on the job, far more efficient and learned than the ordinary teacher. But these are machines, not men and teaching is essentially a relationship between persons. It is alive and emotional in the first place, and not primarily intellectual. A radio or a TV set may have a head, but it has no heart. In places back of beyond, it may be an instrument of literacy, but it cannot become a teacher. What we need to think of more and more is the dedicated rather than the efficient teacher. Efficiency is the highest virtue of machines. The dedication is the hallmark of men. If the two come together, so much the better. The dedication makes teaching a calling. There is nothing to be worried about in regard to the future of education if we keep this difference in mind. The teacher should feel that he has been called to the work he is doing, and not as if it is just another way of earning one's bread. Teaching is not an avocation. It is a vocation.